So Carson is a child that I worked with a lot, uh, number of years ago, and then I've been working with him this summer and he, um, went from not knowing any letter sounds really, and being able to read only the words that his mother had diligently had him memorized. He knew every sight word I could put in front of him, but couldn't decode CVC words at all. And this is what she had to say. I don't know if there's any one thing, but the between the chart tapping and the arm tapping um, and it changing his ability to be able to read. He's always wanted to read. He would always check big books out in the library and he always wanted to read, but when he couldn't, it was really discouraging for him. And I saw a downward spiral in his behavior. And um, since we've been doing the chart tapping and arm tapping and he's able to read and he's progressing, his behavior has changed. Um, his hand-eye coordination has changed. Um, his confidence has grown. And that's why we call it unlocking a superpower because we're really seeing um, a super improvement in his attitude and in his behavior. Um, and it's just been really an awesome blessing to see how much he's grown just by chart tapping every day and um, reciting those things and playing games, which is fun for kids. Yeah. So just the chart tapping and the game playing and doing some writing and a little bit of reading has made a big difference. So the piece about this is that this mom did not follow a sequence of lessons necessarily, but she chart tapped every day. She had him play games every day, but the other piece that she didn't talk about there was that whatever game he was playing, he had to write those words. And this child didn't really write that much when we first started. It was very difficult for him. But when I hadn't seen him for about four or five months and he came in and showed me his notebook, he probably had 20 words or so that he'd written every day. So his sister really managed his work because they're homeschooled. And his sister would make him tap his charts. They would play whatever game it was they had that they'd cut out and were playing. And then she would dictate all the words that were on that game. And if she could think of other words, she would throw other words in there. So all of that arm spelling and writing of the words to helped him to develop the pattern recognition. And we're not saying he was fluent for his age. But he went from reading nothing to being able to decode single syllable words really pretty regularly and doing pretty well with um, multi oh, multi syllable words. So how did he get there? The chart tapping, the arm spelling, the game playing. And I should say arm spelling plus the writing piece uh, with the arm spelling where the child arm spells the word and then they write it. And then following that sequential um, lesson sequence is advisable, right? But when you're working with a child who, um, well, we're going to talk about all those details. So those are the some of the tools. And we have this graphic that actually Leslie made for me that shows the, some of those pieces, the chart tapping and the arm spelling and the game playing. And we've used the salt tray a little bit. And we have our, our um, sequence of lessons in our books. And each of those pieces helps to build those neural pathways between the parts of the brain that have to talk to each other for reading and spelling to happen. And if you can memorize ish that language to be able to share not only with the children, but with the parents that you're working with, that what we're doing is building neural pathways between the parts of the brain that have to talk to each other for reading and spelling to happen. That's an easily digestible, understandable explanation of why you're doing what you're doing. That's the not fancy three parts of the brain story, right? That we need to do all these things to build the neural pathways between the parts of the brain that have to talk to each other for reading and spelling to happen, right? Do you get that? I hope you do. Um, and the piece around all of those activities that we're doing are related to the decoding part of this simple view of reading. That in order for children to have reading comprehension, which means they read something, they can make a picture in their mind of what they've read, that in order for them to have reading comprehension, they have to be able to decode the words. All reading comprehension is predicated on the fact that children can decode 
and decode fluently, which just means that they can decode with ease, which really just means they can read the words with ease, that they're not having to put a lot of energy into reading the words. That piece is the decoding piece. Now, there are other parts under that linguistic comprehension that come into play that impact reading comprehension, but we're not going to talk about those today. But the decoding piece is the part that we're working on. If a child can't decode words, read words with ease, then reading comprehension, their ability to understand or make meaning out of what they're reading is going to go down. And in school, there's a lot of emphasis, particularly third, fourth, fifth grade up on children on reading comprehension activities. Can the child read a passage and answer the questions? Can a child read a passage, understand what they've read, and then go and talk about it, share about it? Can they write a summary of it? Can they retell the story? All of those pieces require that the child has read the passage, the words in the passage with ease. This is critically important when you start to say, particularly working with older children, why we're going back to the beginning on the decoding piece. Because if the legs of the decoding aren't in place, then the rest of it can't happen. So we're gonna use those tools and the tools that we're gonna use are gonna be multi-sensory, that we're gonna use as many senses as we can in a very, kind of almost ritualized way that our work is going to with the children is going to be similar. So they understand what we're going to do, but we're going to move our hands. We're going to speak. We're going to verbalize. Our ears can hear what we verbalize. We're going to use our eyes to look at what it is we're doing, whether those are the letters or the games that we're playing. And all of those pieces are going to work together to help stimulate the brain such that it will move the information that we're working with into long-term memory. The goal is to move it all into long-term memory and then to help the child be able to store it in long-term memory and then also go into long-term memory and retrieve it. And both that storage and, and, sorry, both the storage into long-term memory and the retrieving of information from long-term memory can be tricky for children. That's a characteristic of kiddos with dyslexia. And the first thing that we're going to do with all children is teach them how to tap their charts. And we're also going to start each lesson with chart tapping. You don't have to tap all the charts every lesson. If you've taught the child four charts, you're not going to tap all four charts at the beginning of the lesson. And we'll talk about how do you know what charts to tap or how long should you tap the chart? When do you know when to go on to the next chart? Can I leave a chart alone forever? Should I do it once a week? All of those questions come up. And we're going to talk about those in the weeks ahead. But just be mindful that chart tapping is a key piece. The girl on the top, when she first started tapping her chart, she's the daughter of somebody taking the training. And she was resistant to doing it. So the mom put Smarties. And when the child got to that square and tapped it, she got to eat the Smartie. And she only did that for a little while. And then the child got into the rhythm of doing it and was very inclined to do it. You see Cameron down here in the bottom left. He's our poster child (laughs) for this work and is on the website and is given testimonials. And this is a picture of him tapping his chart, which he's done so many times. And you'll never know how many times it takes um, for a child to tap that chart to move it into long-term memory. But you'll know when it's done because the child will have automatic recall. Leslie actually, actually created this picture on the right for her child at home. She put the charts on just a file folder And that way the chart could stand up straight and similar to having a wall chart, but at home that the child had ready access to the chart, but it didn't take up all their desk space. I loved this idea. So if you're giving parents ideas about ways to have their charts available at home and, you know, printing a wall chart and hanging it up isn't always possible. And besides that, a child might work in more than one place that just Putting a chart inside of a file folder is a really easy way for children to be able to access those charts. I'm Leslie Vaughn. I am the mother of a now 11 year old, but when I first started using um, 
BFR, I was a, um, he was eight. It was horrible. Uh, he had gotten to eight without being able to put his alphabet together. And I have seven other children and they were all readers at various, you know, some people had a little bit of difficulty here or there, but they were fine. Everybody was up and running. And he was just like this rock at the end that I couldn't, I couldn't move. He was the Sisyphus. I just felt like I was pushing him up the hill and the next day it would all just be gone. And he could tell, he could tell that we just spent an hour on this, two hours on this yesterday, the day before, the day before that, and it was gone. And BFR gave him a way of keeping it, keeping what was taught. And that was such a huge difference was how to, it wasn't what I was teaching. It was still just the sounds of the words. It was just, how do I teach it in a way that he actually could hold on to it? That was the big difference for us. And I also work at his school to help um, the kids there. So, um, but that's, that, that, that comes and goes because of my access to them and all that. But the one with my, my son is now at grade level. Um, hey, that's great. But again, it can slide at any time. So, but he's come up, he was three years behind and three or four years behind. So now he's at grade level. And accessing, he's doing his homework by himself. He's able to read his own instructions, do his homework, bring it to me, generally have an okay result. Um, and I just have to tweak a little bit. And so that's huge. I teach first grade and I cannot believe the difference with all of my students. I have one little boy that was retained and he was having a lot of trouble with reading. And his confidence is already going up. So it's super exciting for me. I teach third grade and I'm trying to um, incorporate some of this, the chart tapping, arm spelling into just tier one instruction. And then um, as our differentiation groups get going, I'm going to bring more of this into my small group work but so far it's I think it's been going really well the kids seem to be responding um this week I took Kristen's suggestion and I taught the arm spelling with the non-dominant hand I worked with one of my girls who's trying to spell and she was trying to arm tap it and I showed her how to you know keep your pencil in your hand let's arm tap it with the other hand and then I showed the whole group and then she was really proud she's like yeah she just showed me how to do that um so that was pretty cool and then just as a side note, we were arm chapping and I had a substitute para in my room. And I just said something like, Miss G, listen to this. We're going to tap our charts. It's just going to blow your mind. And so we did it. And she, her comment was, that sounded like a choir. And I was blown away. I was so excited. And the kids all started cheering. And it was just, it was really cool. And it's been just a, a few weeks since I started this. So it's already been really helpful.